Welcome to It's Not What You Think with Morty Levine, where we get to meet and talk to spiritual teachers from around the world. Our guests are from all walks of life and we hear about how they got into spirituality and how they navigate the world we all live in. This is episode 15, recorded on June 14th, 2021. Faith Holmes of the Baha'i has worked in the field of race relations for over 30 years. Faith co-founded Oneness, a national non-profit organization committed to ending racism and promoting the oneness of humanity through music, the arts, and education. Oneness developed and produced over 100 programs during her seven-year tenure. As we speak, Faith is embarking on a new project that includes the intersection of meditation with science and spirituality. Faith Homes can be reached at faithhomes.com. It's Not What You Think podcast is available on all streaming platforms, so please like, comment, share, or subscribe on your favorite platform. That support is enough to continue to allow us to produce this show. Our interviews are with people who may have opinions different from yours or mine. So while we keep an open mind, just remember, it's not what you think. Good morning. I keep saying good morning, but it's good afternoon, and I'm, and we're both right, because it's good morning and good afternoon. Yes. Uh, I don't know how we could both be right, though. One of us has to be wrong, Faith. No, nope, absolutely not. There's oh, man. This in the universe. <laughs> so welcome to It's Not What You Think. I'm so glad you're here. How How is your week now that we've two or three hours into the week. How's it going? It's fantastic. I feel very productive already. So yeah. that's always an exciting way to start off the week. Hey, just getting out of bed is productive, you know? <laughs> um, so so Faith Holmes, of course, is with us. I've already introduced her. And just for our listeners, uh, uh, Baha'u'llah was a, a Persian religious leader from the early 1800s, founder of the Baha'i Faith and an advocate of universal peace and unity among all races, nations, and religions. Pretty all-encompassing, pretty amazing. Can't say that about too many faiths. So uh, we're happy to have you here, of course. Can you tell me how you became involved with that, with the beautiful Baha'i faith? Yeah, it's been quite a journey. My mother heard about the Baha'i faith when she was pregnant with me, and she always was on a spiritual journey, and she loved Christ so deeply. She grew up in the Methodist church. And one Easter Sunday, when she was six or seven years old, the preacher was talking about the crucifixion of Christ, mm. and how the Jews did not recognize the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Right. And she went yeah. running out of the church, crying into the woods that day. And she just begged God. She said, please, if you ever come again in my lifetime, don't allow me to be one of those that don't recognize you. Right. Please allow me to see you. Mm-hmm. And she learned about the Baha'i faith when she was pregnant with me. And it took her three years to really study and search. She had studied all the world's religions, but she really felt like she found her spiritual home here. And when you are born into a Baha'i family, it is not automatic that you are a Baha'i. Wow. So okay. it is up to your own. One of the principles of the Baha'i faith is independent investigation of the truth and how each of us must have our own individual relationship with God and that we have to search that truth out for ourselves. So when I was 14 or 15, I was a little bit of a rebel and I wasn't so sure about religion in my life, even though I liked like logically the Baha'i faith made sense to me, but spiritually, I didn't know if I wanted to follow the rules and I didn't know if I wanted to have somebody tell me what I could and could not do. And luckily when I was 15 years old, two months before my 16th birthday, my mother had an opportunity to take us on Baha'i pilgrimage. And it was December, so it was Christmas time. Mm-hmm. And we got to visit different spiritual holy lands before we went on our Baha'i pilgrimage. And we were in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. <laughs> you know, we were at the Wailing Wall, we were at the Sea of Galilee, and everything was interesting and historical, but it seemed like there was so much disunity in the land. And the morning, Christmas morning, we woke up in Bethlehem and there were 
rocks being thrown at our hotel. And it just felt so incoherent because it's meant to be this spiritual time. And it's funny in the square where the church is built, where Christ was born, was this huge tree that was like a pine tree that they put old sea buoys on, like orange, big, round Mm -hmm. sea buoys as Christmas ornamentations. (laughs) And it's like, wow, look at the West. Look at how the West influences the East, you know, like Christmas, the way that we grew up seeing about it is very different than what it is in the Holy Land. But when we arrived in Haifa, Israel, everything was so unified and so congruent And everything fit together. And it was so spiritually alive that I knew I had found my spiritual home. So that's when I decided to become a Baha'i. What what, best place to make that decision, right? Yeah. Yeah. Must have been really high from that. That's beautiful. Um, So in my research, I found an incredible amount of congruence between the Baha'i faith and and some Buddhist thoughts uh, and Mm -hmm. some wonderful uh, quotes uh, yes. The first one I'm going to throw at you, which I'm sure you've heard. I may have even gotten it from one of your one of your talks. The reality of man is his thoughts. Mm. Yes. So when I heard that, I, I love that uh, Abdul Baha. Uh, that's a quote from Abdul Baha. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, so I've been giving some presentations over the last couple of years called "The Reality of Man Is His Thought." Right, exactly. And I read that quote when I was twelve or thirteen years old, and I always thought that that was spiritual and esoteric and kind of somewhere out here in the woo-woo mystical world. But when I was going through my own personal dark night of the soul, when I was being challenged with one of the greatest tests that I'd ever gone through in my life. And I prayed and I meditated. I realized that that quote, what Abdul Baha was saying, the reality of man is his thought was actually quite literal that we are what we think about, you know, science proves today that we think anywhere from 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts that we had yesterday. Are you reading from my script, by the way? Because no. uh, <laughs> I had that on the second page here. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, the National Science Foundation uh, came out with that a couple of months ago. But even I remember 20 years ago seeing and reading those numbers as well. And. Um, and, I, and my initial reaction was to take out my calculator. And so how's that possible? And, and of course it is, it's not only possible, but it's, now it's a, now it's called, we'll call it a scientific fact. Um, but anyways, yeah, go, go right, before I give you my thoughts, go, go right ahead. No, please go ahead and give me yeah, your thoughts. So I'm the, interested. I mean, I mean, so the first thing, and I mentioned that in a lot of talks that I give as well. And the first thing is, okay, it's interesting. Oh, it's a lot of thinking, a lot of thoughts, a lot of thoughts. Okay, that's interesting. But I think the second fact that you mentioned is far more interesting to me. Yes. Because what it's saying is that uh, um, it's a broken record. It's Mm -hmm. habitual thinking, not Mm -hmm. a lot of creativity going on, not a lot of new stuff going on. And so what are those repetitive, habitual thoughts that we're thinking? And how does that impact our state of mind? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's really interesting because we were talking about Abdul Baha. So Abdul Baha is the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. Mm -hmm. And Abdul Baha came to this country in 1912. And he had grown up in prison with his father from the greater portion of his life. But he gave talks all over this country about the oneness of humanity, about bringing the world together about racial reconciliation and unity. And he gave all of these talks. So that quote, the reality of man is his thought comes from one of those talks. Got it. And another thing that he taught was that if a person has 10 qualities and nine of them are bad, but one of them is good, forget the nine and focus on the one. And in another quote, he says, when a thought of love comes, I mean, when a thought of war comes, oppose it by a greater thought of peace. 
when you have a thought of hatred, replace it by a greater thought of love. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that in relation to what science is now saying, that 90% of the thoughts that we think about every day are the same thoughts as yesterday and the day before that and the day before that, well, then where are we focusing our energy? And is it beneficial to our well-being? You know, science is proving today that stress is a major cause of illness for people. And we kind of go over that record over and over again, over and over again. And that turns into a personality trait. You know, in the beginning, you know, if something bad happens to you and I say, Morty, you know, what happened? Why are you, why aren't you feeling very well today? You'll say, oh, well, two days ago, this thing happened to me and it's put me in a mood. And then, you know, I might see you three months or a year later and I'll say, you know, Morty, how are you doing? And you're like, well, you know, this thing happened to me a year ago and I'm feeling some kind of way about it. And that's called a temperament. Mm -hmm. But then years, sometimes 20 or 30 years go by and you're still feeling angst around that thing that happened to you. And that becomes a personality trait. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to change your personal reality, you have to learn to change your personality. Mm -hmm. And... Go ahead. Yeah. So what's interesting about that and a lot of that thought, that triggered thought is transferable. So it may have happened a year, 10, 20, 30 years ago surrounding that issue, my teacher, but now it's happening at work. So it's that's teacher, that's work. It's two different things. Thirty, But you know what? It's the same trigger and the same reactivity. Um, so to me, the question is, how do we break that habit? Exactly. Um, and uh, the other aspect to it from a, from a Buddhist perspective is we view thoughts as ephemeral. They come and go. There's no power to them unless we give them power. How do we give them power? Well, by thinking the same thought over and over again and letting and us reacting to it over and over again the same way. Now, how are you going to break out of that? That's yes. So at that point, that thought has power over you. Um, but how do we either get get power, not so much power of the thoughts, but recognize them for what they are, which is they're ephemeral, they're fleeting, come and they go. Yeah. And uh, and then I know we're going to get into meditation, which I think is one of the one of the key features of it. Um, before we do, because that's that's another favorite topic of mine, I'm going to throw another quote at you from Abdul Baha: "For every part of the universe is connected to every other part." So. Um, you know, in Buddhism, interdependence is a very key teaching. We're all interconnected. Uh, we also believe in this thing called the law of cause and effect, or we call it karma, same thing. Yep. Yep. And I'm always fascinated to see the similarities among the, the various faiths. So uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, about the, you know, interconnectedness or how, how it, the perspective from the Baha'i perspective. Yeah, I'd love to. So first of all, what we believe as Baha'is is that religion is one, that there is only one God, that because there's one God, there's really only truly one religion because mm -hmm. that's the faith of God and that all humanity is one. Mm -hmm. So we believe that religion is progressive and that God which we don't see as man, you know, we've been taught in the Judeo-Christian sense to see man, God as a man, mm -hmm. if you will. Sure. But what we've been taught is that what Baha'u'llah says God is, is an unknowable essence, mm -hmm. that the creator knows the creation, but the creation cannot comprehend the creator. Mm -hmm. So when we create something, we understand that creation, but that creation doesn't necessarily understand us. So God sends prophets, manifestations, messengers throughout times in history to bring humanity forward, both spiritually and socially. So one of the things that Christ said 
was I have many things to tell you, but your ears cannot hear them, your eyes cannot see. Of course, Christ knew there were people on the other side of the world who spoke a different language, who were different skin colors, like all of those things. But we as humanity, had we learned those things at that time, we would not have been prepared for them. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 that's a great point. And what that's reminiscent to me is of, you know, there are plenty of people that met, met Christ. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they chose not to follow him. You know, it's almost like, and the same thing with the Buddha. Plenty of people met the Buddha and decided not to follow and play, met Moses and, you know, Prophet Muhammad, meaning that it's a frequency, I think, or maybe even a clarity of mind. Mm, I love and, that. And if you don't have that clarity and you have all these clouds or this dirt or you're wearing, you know, dirty glasses, you're not going to see it. You're not going to be excited. You're not going to be enthused. You're not going to be inspired. You're just not going to get it. And, and I think, uh, and it doesn't mean you won't get it tomorrow, but right now you're not getting it. Yeah. So, um, so this, that just refers to, you know, yeah, sometimes just people aren't ready. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say they're immature or I, just, I think it's a, the best way I can kind of like a clarity mind or frequency. And if you're not there, you're not, I think maybe even better open-minded. Yeah. If I'm pretty sure about how the world is and who I am and who you are and and what God is or what a higher being is, and it's this way or no way, and something comes from over here or over here, I'm not going to see it. Yeah. That's the, so I think it's an open mindedness thing to. I, I think that is a really important key that you brought up. I think frequency is something that we need to talk a lot more about because we carry with us an emotional vibrational frequency that we bring into every room that we enter, every space that we are in. And we can choose to have that be of a higher frequency or a lower frequency. And I think a lot of us, I've become the student of the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm -hmm. I've done a very deep dive into his um, teachings and philosophy and one of the reasons for that was because when I heard him talking about the things that he was talking about, I saw that he was proving scientifically what Baha'u'llah said spiritually. So it was really truly the perfect combination and marriage of science and religion, which the Baha'i writings say, Baha'u'llah said that science and religion are one. So, you know, it was that perfect harmony. And one of the things that he talked about was that we either live in a state of survival or we live in a state of creation. And we're in, when we are in a state of survival, that is a much lower frequency. Whereas when we are in a state of creation, we're at a much higher level of frequency. So I think that the other thing I want to circle back around to is that, you know, we think that we can judge someone else's path. Of course. That is <laughs> the most dangerous thing because each one of us are a special <laughs> creation from God. So who do we think that we are to judge another person's path? And if we're truly praying to God to show us what it is that I use for lack of a better term, he wants for us in our life. If we believe that each one of us were given a special gift from our creator, and I don't care if you call that creator, God, creation, the great mystery, the universe, source, essence, Allah, you know, I don't care what you call it. All of us have a relationship with that divine source that created us. And for me to think that I can judge your path and think whether or not it's right or wrong is out of alignment with my creator. Yeah, let, let me give you my view on that. We, at, at, at the 12, or I've seen different numbers, 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day, and I meditate quite a bit, I barely know what's going on in my mind. So I'm going to 
try to hazard a guess as what's going on in your mind. You know, I kind of bring that up when people are, we, myself included, are judgmental. Oh, they said it because, of, oh, they're this. Uh, it's like, like hey, wait a second. Yeah. You know, thousands of possibilities of what's in someone else's mind. We now know there's literally thousands. So if I don't know what's going on in my mind, and like I said, I spend quite a bit of time, you know, meditating, there's no way. And, um, you know, because we can be very judgmental. Well, he, she, me, a ju inner critic too, judgmental about myself. Um, so, yeah. And, and I, go ahead. That's an interesting um, aspect as well on the Baha'i faith. We are to take ourselves to account each day. That at the end of every day, we're to ask two questions. Is there anything that I've done that is not pleasing to my Lord today? And then to recount those things, but not in a way of guilt or oppression, but in a way of, if I had to do it over again, how would I do it differently? Please help me to do better tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. And then to say, is there anything that I've done that was pleasing to my Lord? And to recount all of those things and to ask for those to be strengthened for all eternity. So there's no place for guilt in the Baha'i faith. There's only a reckoning that we have of ourselves with our creator, that, you know, that personal relationship. And then every 24 hours, I get a chance to do it over again and do it better. Yeah, no, it's be it's beautiful because it's an iterative process of improvement. And oh, you're, you're in, in a process of improvement of the, I hate to use the word for lack of a better word, the self. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't like to use that word is because uh, the self is a funny, <clears throat> a funny topic in Buddhism. We, we believe there is a self, but just not in the way we think it is, <laughs> you know? Yeah, we um, agree. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a quote here that I, um, I, re I read an article called Silencing the Inner Critic by Christina Feldman, a Bud Buddhist teacher. And I just love the quote and I put it here for some reason. So I'm sure it's related to something we're talking about. Habit and awareness do not coexist. Mm, Habit and yes. awareness cannot, do not. As I, to me, it's like, okay, it gets back to all those thoughts. Habit, yes. habit, habit, habit. Yes. You know, or awareness. So um, it's, 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 a, it's applicable. And then there was, a, here's a quote. We're going to play a little, little uh, game. Here's a quote by a great Baha'i teacher. Let's see if you can tell me who said it. Oh. I can control my actions and reactions and reactions to things. Does it sound familiar? I can control Sounds my like actions. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got it from one of your talks. I said, okay, let's see if she recognizes it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's really interesting because when I was going through my darkest period in life, I I owned a cafe with a dear friend of mine and it ended up becoming a financial failure, which right. in my creation of this cafe, there was no way it could fail. Like there was no. Okay. <laughs> I got to I got to stop you for a second. So there's two two things, and once just my background briefly, I've got about twenty five different entrepreneurial ventures in the last forty years. Eighty percent of them have failed, but I hate that word, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's an article in the New York Times about a month ago uh about this uh a black kid in new york city came to from i think kenya or nigeria with his family seven years old and started playing chess in the public school system and became a chess i don't know if a national grandmaster i don't know all the titles and at the end of the article uh i think the interviewer nicholas christoph said to him you know how does it feel when you lose and you know what the kid said he's 10 years old he goes oh i don't lose i learn wow I was like, I, I, I sat back and I, I said, oh my God. Wow. Like, first Out of all, of the mouths of babes. Kids 10, give me, <laughs> unbelievable. But that's exactly it. So you may not have met your expectations. I don't even know what failure means because maybe you could have stayed in business and been a financial success, but then all of a sudden you get hit by a car the next day. So, you know what? Okay, 
I'll take the one without the financial success. So you, we don't know who, what would have, could have, should have, would have happened. So I just look at it that way. Absolutely. And I will say for sure that that's a part of my journey. But when you bring another individual who was my best friend and investor in the business, people have different viewpoints Absolutely. of how things turn out. Absolutely. So I think there was a lot more pressure for me because when I had, this was a second business of mine. And so for my first business, if anything happened to it, it only impacted me. Whereas bringing on a partner, an investor, then it also impacted someone else. And that was, I think, my greatest burden, because had it only been a financial failure for myself, then I would have just picked myself up, brushed myself off and moved on. But the fact that it impacted someone I love so greatly in such a negative way has been a great burden for me over the years. And so I did everything that I could to make sure that this place thrived and was a success. And although it did, it was a financial failure, it was not a failure in what we created because it was truly a gift to the community and it changed many lives. And it was a beautiful space. It was called Love and Faith Community Cafe. And, you know, it, where I started here was that in a two week period, my everything around the cafe started to crumble. I, my ice cream pasteurizer broke down. A few days later, my ice maker broke down. We were a cafe. A week later, my espresso machine broke down. I mean, how can you be a cafe and not be able to offer great quality espresso coffee drinks? And then finally, the crowning blow was within that two week period, my front doors, I had these beautiful, huge glass doors that opened out into the street and they got stuck open. And a locksmith told me that it would be $1,200 to shut it. Got it. And he wasn't sure that I would, it would fix the problem. <laughs> I was just like, I give up. I just, I, obviously I'm not supposed to have this cafe anymore. Like it's very clear. The universe is sending me every single sign possible, but we had a lease and it wasn't like we could just close the doors. And I went home and I called someone who was, you know, kind of a spiritual confidant in my life. And I, was crying and I shared all my woes with her. And at the end of her hearing me, she said, Faith, I'm so sorry. I've got nothing for you. I was just like, what do you mean you have nothing for me? Like, this is where I go for her. Like, you know, she always shows me the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and I went to bed that night and I prayed and meditated in a way that I have never prayed and meditated before. You know, the next morning, again, I prayed and meditated. And in that meditation, I learned two things. And the first thing was that I couldn't control anything but two things. There are two things I can control and that's all. The first thing are my actions, and my second is the, my reactions. Those are the only two things in life that I can control. So, so yeah, that, that's beautiful. And the way, uh, the way I phrase it is very slightly different, but it's the same concept, just fixing my microphone here, is um, the only thing that we can control is our state of mind. Yeah. It's directly really just different different way to phrase it. Um, yeah because I can't control what happens to me. I can control how I react or don't react to it. Yeah. Um, so you, anyways, your voice got very low, okay. Morty. Yeah, there we go. Thanks for mentioning that. So, um, yeah, so it's the same thing. And once you realize that, it's, it's very freeing. 
because I want that person to do this. I want that to happen. I want that to happen. It's like, hey, good luck with that. <laughs> and the illusion is sometimes what you want to have happen will happen. Yeah. And you think, oh, this is great. Look what I got. Look what I did. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have these expectations. And these expectations, sometimes they're met, sometimes they're not met. They're met, you're happy. They're not met, you're angry or irritated yeah. or annoyed or depressed or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So that's a hell of a game to play. And you're on a cycle. And that's when you're on that habitual cycle with all those thoughts. And, uh, and the way I look at it is some of the things, you know, if we set ourselves these goals and the goals are met, we're happy. And if we set ourselves these goals or expectations and they're not met, we're angry. So, so what we do is instead of being goal oriented, be process oriented. And it's something related to what you said earlier, which is if I'm aware of, I think you used the word curiosity. If I'm aware of what's happening now and I'm curious about it and I'm in learning mode, then it's a win. Whether I get Always. to the top of the mountain or not, whether yeah. I make money or not, it's a win. Yeah. And I'm very sorry your friend did not make money. And that's... We don't want to hurt anyone, um, but we're all big boys and big girls, and, and we can be apologetic, and we can tr do our best so that they don't feel badly about it. But at the end of the day, yes, we have goal, let's make money, but we have something else here, which is, hey, I need to be in the present moment and be curious and learn as I go down these challenging paths. Right. Not easy. <laughs> It's the, it's the lessons of life. You know, my dad constantly says school costs and the school of life is expensive. So, you know, every, every lesson that we learn brings us to our next thing though. You know, one of the other things that Dr. Joe Dispenza often says is what if the worst thing that ever happened to you ends up becoming the best thing that ever happened to you? And I would not be where I am today had that not happened. So for me, it ended up becoming a blessing in my life. Well, we have an expression for that. By the way, is my microphone okay now or no? It could go up just a little okay. more. Right, thank you. So we have an expression in our family. It's not in our, just our family. Uh, good luck, bad luck, maybe. Yeah. I don't know if you know the Zen farmer story. It, I don't. It, it doesn't have to be Zen farmer. It could be the Baha'i farmer. Uh, where he, you know, he's going to take out, uh, let his horses out to go get the harvest. And the son goes to the farm, to the barn. I'm from Brooklyn, so I don't really know much about this stuff. And the horses are out. They, they ran. So he can't get the, bring the harvest in. So all the, all the townspeople, oh, what bad luck you have, Zen master farmer. You can't bring in your harvest. And he goes, well, you know, good luck, bad luck, maybe. Son goes out into the valley and sees, gets the horses back and brings back even more horses that are there. And so now they can bring in even more of a harvest. And, uh, oh, what is, is a, the village people? Oh, what good luck you have, Zen Master Farmer. Oh, you know, the, all these horses and you'll get bigger harvest. Oh, good luck, bad luck, maybe. Son's putting on the horseshoes and gets kicked in the chest, breaks some ribs, has to go to the hospital. What bad luck you have, Zen. And then the country goes to war. They can't bring the son into war who's mm -hmm. going to get killed. Because in the hospital, so what? Good luck. It. Who knows? You just don't know. You want if you can predict the future, then we have we have to have another conversation offline. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so same thing. Good luck. Bad luck. Bad. Doesn't mean to trivialize. Mm -mm. It doesn't. It just means we don't have to add another layer of baggage. Right. Yeah. We make a mess, or someone makes a mess. We clean it up. Absolutely. Right. Do what right. you got to do. Right. But we don't like, oh my God, look what happened. I can't believe it. Now it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it's applicable there. So I love that story. I just heard it for the first time in the last few months. So oh, okay. I didn't realize that that was the title of it. Um, but I love that story because, you know, we judge what happens to us often. Good luck, bad luck, maybe, but we don't know. You know, that that son didn't go off to war because the horse kicked him, you know, so it's like we don't know what the ultimate plan of God is. Very, very sophisticated, just, very complicated, yeah. very sophisticated. And from what I, and, and from what I 
believe or understand, I should say, is maybe there's a few great, 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 great saints out there from any religion, could be Buddhist, Hindu, Baha'i, and maybe these guys, gals, who spent years and years and years and years meditating and praying and, and they're clear as a bell and they're very high frequency, maybe they can kind of like, I don't want to use the word predict, but have an understanding of cause and effect of the future. But for 99.99999% of us, and it's not like they even try because that's not what they're interested in. They're just interested in living their lives. Right, right. So, um, so I have a quote here from Dr. Joseph Dispenza, how we create our own reality, how we create our own reality. So, um, I found that, I found that very interesting. You know, and there's another quote by another famous Baha'i teacher named Faith Holmes. What we give out energetically <laughs> is what we attract to us. Yeah. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense. Um, you know, if you're out there, you know, it's kind of like we have the, the law of karma, which is the same thing. You know, if I'm out there being angry, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> you know, if I'm yelling yeah. at you, you're going to yell at me. Or yeah. I'm going to be in an environment of yelling. Or I'm more likely to yell again in the future because I'm now creating that habit. Yeah. And that may have been me quoting Dr. Joe Dispenza. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> that possible. <quote. laughs> well, in my notes, it says Faith Home. So I'm just going to yeah. go with that. Yeah. I may not, when I said it, I may not have attributed the quote to him, but yeah, um, you know, he, he talks a lot about that kind of how we, what we put out into the world is what we draw to us. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that vibration that we have to be very clear on so that we put out the right things in the world. Yeah, and and it's directly um, correlated with with the law of karma. The, the karma Absolutely. karma in in a very simple sense is, if I do something now, if I'm a generous person right now, I give someone hundred dollars, a homeless person, a, a nonprofit organization, three things happen. One is I'm more likely to do it again in the future. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yep. Someone's more likely to be generous with me, yep. and I'm more likely to find myself in a generous environment. That's kind of the three basics. And it could be yeah. angry. I'm yelling at someone. Well, more likely to get yelled at, more likely to yell again, creating that yeah. habit, more likely to be in an environment of yelling or anger or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so you know, what he says, you know, 100% true. Uh, so another favorite topic of mine, all these wonderful topics, is fear, mm. dealing, dealing with fear. So I have a quote here from Baha'u'llah, love is a light that never dwells in a heart possessed by fear. So yeah. Fascinating. Um, Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's just so true. To me, it's it's from, from a few levels. One is we all think we're multitasking. Oh, I can do this and do that, and I'm on the phone, and I'm with you, and da, 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 right and da, da. It's like, no, we don't really multitask. We think we are, but we're not. You know, we need to be in the present moment. We need to be clear. We don't want to be all over the place. And this is a, a just a, a corollary of that, which is you know if you are if you have this habit, we'll call it, of being angry, irritable, fearful, or whatever, then you, light's not going to be able to shine. If you can get your you know love or that light to shine, then f there's no room in there for fear. You can't get in. Well, then let me ask you a question: Can you be fearful? If you're only living in the present moment. No. Was that quick enough for you? You're only fearful <laughs> if you're living in the past or you're predicting the future. That's the only time you're living in a state of fear. You're singing my song. <laughs> if you're living in the clear present moment of now, it's impossible to be fearful unless you're being chased by a tiger or, you know, a car accident in that, in that moment, you could have fear, but it will be like seconds, not hours or days or weeks or months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's a, here's a quote from my, my teacher. The past is history. The future is mystery. The present moment is a gift. Yes, exactly. So um, I'm a, I'm a rock climber. So I climb mountains and things like that. And if you are, 
have fear. Oh, I'm going to fall. Oh, can I do this? I don't know if I could do this. I don't see my next handhold. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Well, that's one mentality. But if you are able to, and it takes training, this is not going to happen. It's meditation. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but if you can be curious and I'm going to learn what I'm doing and I'm going to just be in the present moment, then you can't, you can't have both. Right. So you have to train your mind and break that habit. Yep of reacting with fear. And to us, fear is the underlying underlying cause for anger, irritation, annoyance, depression. It's all fear-based and it Absolutely. shows itself in many ways. Yeah. Um, so I loved when he said, love is a light that never dwells in a heart possessed by fear. So from a very, but on the other hand, I'm a very practical person. I, you know, theories and poems and poetry and allegory and metaphors, they're beautiful. Yeah. But you know what? I'm a super practical person. So if I can't figure, if I can't be taught something to, that's going to really work for me, I'm not interested in it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not so, way too more. Right. So, uh, so what do you do when, when you feel fear? It's part A and part B is what do you teach others? Maybe even someone who's not Baha'i. Mm -hmm. how to deal with fear and anxiety. So for me, when I go into fear, I head straight for prayer and meditation. Right. And meditation is something newer for me. I've prayed all my life. And in the Baha'i writings, interestingly, there's a lot that says meditate profoundly or meditate on these verses or, but there has never been much emphasis in the Baha'i community as a community on meditation, but prayer is very important. So for me today, when I go into fear, the first place I go is I take that fear to God and I try to give it over to know that God, great mystery, universe, again, whatever you want to call that unknowable <laughs> essence in your life can figure out the solution to that answer much greater than you can because you only have this much knowledge. You know, you can't see what, you know, in the infinite universe, how many possibilities there are. So that's the first place I go when I have fear around something. And I'm sorry, I forgot the second question. No, that's okay. So the, the questions were, what do you do when you feel fear? And then yeah. what do you teach others? Maybe even someone who is not yeah. religious oriented. Uh, or maybe even someone who, I'm going to make it a harder question for you. Someone who doesn't believe in God. What, you do, know, you, what, do, you, what do you do? So, so agnostic and atheism are two very different things, right? So the agnostic... I can have a much easier conversation with than necessarily the atheist. Oh, right. Okay. Because our worldview is so geometrically opposed to one another in that I don't see how perfect our creation is without there being a creator. Understood. I too don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. <laughs> like that you know, man sitting on a throne in judgment. That's not, I don't believe in that either. But do I believe that there is, I mean, I was a creation of my mother and father. I would not be here without that creator. How can the universe not have a creator? So, but what I share with people is that we are responsible for what it is that our gift in the world is. And when we live in a state of fear, we can't bring that to the forefront because we're living in survival. Whereas when we can give it over to whatever source that is for you, we can start to create. And when we become the creators, then we can create beautiful things in our world. But it's a process. You know, by the time we're 35 years old, they say that 90% of our subconscious, re like our subconscious is completely formed. Mm -hmm. So whatever we've programmed 
into ourselves. By the time we're 35 years old, we're gonna have to fight really hard if it's been negative and lack and unworthiness and you know all of the lower vibrational frequency things of fear it's going to be a lot harder to reprogram, but it's possible through prayer and meditation. It takes work. It takes consistency. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I, I agree a thousand percent. Um, you know, I, I tell students that, hey, you know, you've been developing this habit for 10, 20, 30 years. You think you're going to sit down for 12 minutes, meditate, and it's got gone? Good luck. You know, I'll sign up for that one. So um, we all would, yeah. and we'd pay whatever money was necessary if we could get rid of it that quickly. Oh yeah, just give me a pill. Yeah, and I'm good. <laughs> uh, so you know, and, and as I mentioned earlier, fear you know comes from a, a trigger, something that happens to us, or a thought that we think. It could be from external, it could be from internal, mm -hmm. and then that causes some resistance to how we think life should be. Mm -hmm. well, I shouldn't have lost money on that. that. That's not what I should have. So the greater there is that resistance is, um, so, I, so I also have a view of myself and how the world should be. I'm a good businessman. I'm a fair person. I'm a nice person. Um, I, people should be treating me fairly. So we have all these expectations. Yeah. And when something rubs up against that, that all of a sudden, the, 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 the thing that I call the myself, all of a sudden is like, well, that's not, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm a fair person. I, why, why didn't I make money? Or why did they do this or whatever? The greater the rub, the greater the fear, the greater the, the negative reaction. Um, so anger, annoyance, anxiety, all of which are, are fear-based. So what we try to do is we try to break, how are you gonna break the habit of allowing ourselves to be triggered? Stuff's gonna happen. Crap's Always. gonna happen. There's yep. gonna be things that go wrong. Yep. Failure. Yep. I don't use those words, but that's it's not gonna go the way we expected. That's what I'm yep. gonna say from now on, by the way. I'm not gonna yep. use the word failure. I'm not yep. gonna use the word wrong. It's yep. just not the way I expected it to be. So we can't allow ourselves to get triggered by that. So how do we break that habit? And for us, there's all these tools and techniques and the kind of, I don't want to say they're all the same. There's just different ways to approach it. For for me, well, sorry, there's one thing that precedes that, which is because we meditate, we meaning you and myself, you start to be able to be sensitive and say, oh, I feel angry. Guess what? You know how many people are walking around there angry? They don't even know they're angry or upset or stressed or whatever. They don't even realize it until 10, 20, 30 years later, then the doctor's office who says, you know, you're a pretty stressed guy, you know, gal. Yeah. You've got something going on over here. Yeah. So the first step is you got to recognize that you've got a negative state of mind. Yeah. Then the next step is, okay, great. Now that we see that and I feel that and observe that, got it. What's So how do we break the trigger? And for, for one of the go-tos for me is, okay, just breathe. Yeah. Just observe yeah. your breath. Be in the moment by observing your breath. I'm going to oversimplify yeah. a, a technique. Yeah. Because right away, okay, now, boom, we've broken the habit. What's the habit? The habit is, God damn it, I da 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 So we're breaking that habit by just simply breathing and paying attention to our breath. And then, of course, you can try to feel the stress in your, in your physical body. And, you know, there's, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but that's one way to start to break that habit. Yeah, and I really love that you're talking about breathing because the majority of us, especially when we're living in survival, have shallow breathing. And one of the ways to kind of shut the autonomic nervous system or to bring on the autonomic nervous system is to breathe deeply. Absolutely. And the deeper we breathe, the more we go out of the fight or flight response. Because when we're living in survival, we're typically in fight, flight, or freeze. And so if we really want to get out of that, you know, I lived for, gosh, many, many, many years just in nothing but stress. And I, I really believed, Brene Brown talks about how we wear stress as a badge of honor. You know, it's like, you know, when we ask people, how are you doing? And you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out. And there's this and this and this. And we, we wear it proudly. Like, you know, we're not, 
we're not accomplishing enough in the world if we're not living in that state. And it was very interesting because when the cafe was crumbling around me, I had gone to see a chiropractor and he had shared with me that, you know, when the adrenal glands are pumping all the hormones that are needed for the health of your body, but you're in that stressed out state, you know, we for hundreds of years lived in survival as far as environmental issues. So if we were being chased by a tiger, when we'd run away, we would exert so much energy that we could then very easily go back to grazing because, and our food could digest and all that stuff because the threat was no longer there. But when we're dealing today with not having enough money to pay your bills or the loss of a loved one or losing your job or any of the environmental stress issues that we deal with today, we don't turn off that fight or flight response because we're not exerting ourselves in the way that we need to. So one of the things that my chiropractor had shared with me, which I was really kind of amazed by, because he was the only person who had ever shared this with me in my life, was that, Faith, when you're having a really stressful day, I need you to run around the block as fast as you can for three minutes, just three minutes. But if you exert your most, like your capacity of exertion in those three minutes, you'll turn off the stress response and your body will stop pumping those chemicals, which then will can turn into disease in your body. So, wow. Why didn't, I mean, I'm 40, you know, I'm, I'm, I was, I don't know, 45, 46 years old when he shared this with me. And I'm like, how is this the first time that anyone ever taught me this? Like as a child, had I been taught this, I could have incorporated that into the rest of my life. You're getting me going. Man. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, some of the examples I give, and then I want to talk a little bit about education, is that, you know, when the giraffe is being chased by the lion, stress goes up 100%, you know, adrenaline, cortisol, all this other stuff. And, uh, and if they survive... If they don't survive, it's not a problem. But and while this is all, all this is happening, all their other systems get turned off. The digestive system, the um, reproductive system, all these systems, because you mm -hmm. don't need it. You got to survive. Right. right. And if they survive, then very, very short period of time later, the systems go back on and they go back to life. Yep. And that's not what happens with us. Hmm. With us, when we feel that stress, we don't release it. We're in that constant state of stress you, you talked about. So, um, so the re reproductive system does degrade and mm -hmm. the digestive system does degrade and mm -hmm. you know, the blood flowing in and out and all that other stuff does degrade and stays degraded or degrades even more. Yeah. So, um, that's, that's very un unfortunate of course. And so, so once again, how do you break that habit? And you're talking now about, well, now I've got to break a habit that I've, you know, I'm 62, that's been around for a long time. Yeah. Wouldn't it have been nice if when I was going to school, they said, you know, welcome oh. to school. The reason we have you coming to school is because we're going to teach you how to be a healthy, happy human being. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're also going to teach you math and English mm -hmm. and religion and history. Yeah. But those aren't the main things. The most important thing is we're going to be teaching you breathing or yoga, or what, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Mm -hmm. It could be tea ceremony for all I care, flower arranging, mm -hmm. whatever you, you call it, but whatever brings your mind to the present and allows you to control your own state of mind. I would That's, be a completely different human being today had I been taught that in school. <laughs> so instead, I, I was taught to be highly competitive, mm -hmm. um, goal, very goal-oriented, you're either, excuse me, you're either a winner or a loser. Which do you want to be? All yep. your friends over there, they're winners. You want to be yep. a winner? Yep. Yep. So, and of course comes uh, together with that goal orientation comes, well, when you're a loser, you feel stress. Mm -hmm. So, we, and then, and then you're on that whole other uh, cycle of got to win, 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 win. So, I, you know, I, I don't have the global answer, but I have a tiny answer, which is, okay, let's, 
you know, because you and I are going to solve the world's problems right now. Let's build a school where that is not the goal, but it's more to develop happy, healthy human beings. Well, I've got something for you that will really excite you. Okay. So my mother has lived on Pine Ridge, Lakota Indian Reservation in South Dakota for the last 30 years. Okay. And her and her husband, her her husband was a 38th generation Lakota medicine man. 38 generations. Like, can any of us trace our lineage back like that? I mean, it's really phenomenal. And gosh, six, seven years ago, they were, their reservation, there's 40,000 people on their reservation. They had the youth and children in their community. There were 500 attempted suicides and they were at a complete loss. And Peter was invited to serve on a panel at NIH, the National Institute of Health. Mm -hmm. And the Surgeon General was the moderator. And he was invited to come and speak about women's reproductive health, which we are having a crisis in this country and even in the world with women's reproductive health. And part of that very much has to do with the stress that you just talked about, but no one is talking about it from that perspective. Not no one, very few, very few, especially in the medical community. So when it got to Peter's turn, he said, I'm here, I'm Peter Catches, and I'm here because the children on my reservation are killing themselves at alarming rates, and I'm here to figure out answers as to why, because I'm at the National Institute of Health. (laughs) And the surgeon general, my mother was kind of embarrassed. She was just like, he wasn't invited here for that. And the surgeon general invited him back the next year and said, Peter, I've thought all year about what it is that you asked of us last year. And he said, here's what we found out being in the health industry for the last 60, 70 years. The best money spent is on prevention, the earlier, the better. And they went home and they created a seven year curriculum for children that starts in second grade and goes to the eighth grade And it's based on the medicine wheel. It's a full body approach to health and wellness. And it's called Life Skills for the Young Lakota. The nonprofit that developed it is called Ochitawakan. And it is looking at humanity, looking at us as though we have four bodies. We have the physical body, we have the emotional body, we have the spiritual body, and we have the mental body. And these children, it's a daily class in school. It's the homeroom class of every single day. And they go around the medicine wheel 14 times in a year. There's 56 lessons. And they're learning all about the things that you and I are talking about right now. Uh, I'm um, so how many years has this been going on for? It, we are going into our second year of it going into the schools. And right now it's only on the Lakota reservations. So it's not spread further and it's very culturally based. It's called life skills for the young Lakota. And there's also um, life skills for the young Native American. But my mother really has the intention in the future to create a multicultural one so that all students are are included and she'd really love to see one done like life skills for the young African-American or life skills for the young Latin X or, you know, people who have been marginalized. So it's very exciting. So no, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so I guess my question is probably too early to tell from a statistical perspective. Oh, it look is. what we've achieved. But yeah. are there anecdotal, is there anecdotal evidence that these kids are changing their, how they're viewing the world or their state of mind? We're creating at the moment, we're creating a survey monkey to make sure that we are doing pre and post testing so that we can do that. We had planned on that last year when this got instituted into the schools, but sadly because of COVID, none of the pre and post testing took place. But we are also currently writing a grant for to finish the curriculum for high school students. So it's gonna be Wo Lakota. Wo Lakota means living a life in balance and bravery. 
And so Woe Lakota Life Skills for Teens. So we're writing a grant right now that will help finish out. So it'll be K through 12th grade. And once we have that in place, we are doing testing to make sure that it's an evidence-based. Right. Practice. And I'm wondering how much of the, the uh, curriculum includes their culture. Uh, the whole thing, they've okay. collected 400 ancestor stories okay. and put each story with a lesson. So they're getting the education in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, they're learning about what it is that you need to keep your physical body healthy, sleep, nutrition, exercise, just to name a few. Yep, but yep, yep. every class also starts out with a trauma healing exercise, meditation, tapping, deep breathing, talking circles, dance and movement, yoga. So the first three to five minutes of every class is dedicated to one of those trauma healing exercises. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we can talk afterwards, but I'm excited to, to see that because that's exactly, that is the promise of the future. The more we implement that in any way, shape or form to every child, yes. Yes. regardless of politics, religion, color, blah, 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 then we're all going to be better off three, five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. I was listening to a podcast um, that where Dr. Joe Dispenza was being interviewed, and I don't remember if it was drama or if it was Lewis Howe was one of those two men. And both of them said it at different times. One of them was with when Dr. Joe Dispenza was on, but another one said the exact same thing. It was another guest, but they were saying this emotional intelligence that we're talking about here today, how is it that we didn't learn this in school? And one of the other things that Dr. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about is that, you know, when our brains are developing the most between like seven years old and 18 or 19 years old, our brains are these sponges that is learning everything. If we had hardwired into our brains, meditation, tapping, the understanding for what the healthy practices and life skills we need for the physical, the emotional, the spiritual and mental body were at that time, we wouldn't have to work so hard at changing our lives today as adults. So getting that in at that early age is so important. Yeah, and there are some cultures that do that, um, like the, Tibet, the Tibetan culture. We're not uh, one of them, but there are. <laughs> right, the Tibetan culture does that. You know, I, I know a number of Tibetans, and they have a very different view and outlook on life. Yeah. Um, their primary, I don't want to use the word goal, is what can I do to help others and compassion? Sure, am I in business? Do I want to make money? Of course, but that's not number one. Number one is helping someone else, compassion for themselves, serve? compassion yeah. for others. How do we serve? Exactly. Yeah. How do we serve? Yeah. There was a, a, a teacher, um, Ram Das, who's mm -hmm. born, born Jewish, became a Buddhist or Hindu, I'm not quite sure. And uh, I think he wrote a book, How Do I Serve, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they interviewed him uh, towards the end of his life, and they said, you know, when you go to heaven, if you believe in heaven, you know, and you meet God, you know, what do you want to say to him? He goes, hey, you know, how can I be of service? Well, and that's imbued in, in the mentality of these, of a lot of these folks. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's super impressive that they're doing that. And I hope and pray that that really works enough so that we can start to spread that other cultures, uh, yeah. within our society, things like that. Me too. Um, so almost the last question. Uh, in your bio, it says uh, you're working on a new project that includes the intersection of meditation with science and spirituality. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what can you share about that? Wow. Well, so one of the things that, you know, we've been talking a little bit about is meditation, right? And I know when we spoke before that that is one of the things that you love to talk about on this podcast. So if you don't mind, I'd like to back up just a little bit and then circle back around to the question, if that's all right Absolutely, with you. Absolutely, of course. So 
as I mentioned previously, like prayer was a big part of my life always growing up, but meditation was nowhere a part of my life. Like if someone had ever told me that I would become like a proponent of everyone in the world needs to meditate, I would have looked at you and said, you obviously don't know me. (laughs) I'm not able to meditate. I don't know how people do it. And I was introduced to an incredible woman by the name of Kathy Grammer. Sadly, she's no longer with us. She passed 11 years ago of breast cancer. But if you've ever heard of Red Grammer's songs from, he's a a child uh, musician. And I didn't know, I'll I'll check it out. Yeah, Red Grammer is something. So he was, uh, Kathy Grammer was his wife. And they, she co-wrote a lot of the songs with Red Grammar, and she was an incredible woman. Uh, you may know about the artist Andy Grammer. This is Andy Grammer's mother as well. Oh, okay, okay. So she was a, she is a phenomenal soul, and she started working with groups of women and doing group meditations. And I couldn't meditate. I didn't know how. I wasn't like, I just was not into meditation. And I was invited to a group women's meditation evening and I went and I had the most phenomenal experience. And she took us through a guided meditation and she had us kind of cover our eyes with either an eye mask or a scarf or something, because what she talked about was that, you know, even when our eyes are closed, we see shadows and to really get into a deep state of detachment and meditation, it's important to like close out the rest of the world as much as possible. And then she guided us through a 15 minute meditation And she created a meditation CD. I'm hoping someday that these three meditations that she did will be up on YouTube for people to enjoy. So if ever they are, I will contact you and maybe you can add in the notes on the bottom of our screen where people can get those because they're really powerful. And I, I had the most phenomenal experience. And I started using her meditation technique and it was only 15 minutes. So it was the perfect time period for me. And because I really, you know, if someone was to ask me to sit down and, or go to a meditation that was going to be an hour or something, I would have been like, (laughs) there's no way. Not happening, not happening today. (laughs) And now I can go five hours, which I mean, had anybody told me that I would have been like, no, that's never going to happen. So Kathy Grammer was an incredible influence in my life as far as meditation was concerned and really taught me to have very spiritual and mystical experiences. Like I just had all of these incredible things happen during that time. So it really showed me kind of the oneness of the worlds of God, if you will, and the way that when we go to that place of meditation, it's interesting because I think Abdul Baha says, and it's not a direct quote, but my understanding of what he says is that when we are praying, we are asking for something. Whereas when we are meditating, we are hearing our soul speak to us. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. So A number of years pass. I moved to Washington, D.C. I open a couple of businesses. My life starts to fall apart. And I am introduced to the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. Right. And he wrote a book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. (laughs) I was like, I need to read that book because I really need to break the habit of being myself. And I did a really deep dive into his work and his philosophy. And as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, you know, one of the principles of the Baha'i faith is the oneness and the harmony of science and religion. Mm -hmm. And here he was proving scientifically the power of our thoughts. And so he's proving scientifically what I grew up always believing spiritually. So when Abdul Baha said the reality of man is his thought, And I thought that that was spiritual and esoteric and somewhere outside of me. 
when I went through this dark night of the soul within my own life, I realized Abdu'l-Bahá was speaking quite literally. So what, when Abdu'l-Bahá says that joy is a better cure for your illnesses than a hundred thousand medicines, <laughs> he's not talking spiritual and esoteric. He's talking quite literally. He means it. He means that. And I've never believed that. And I would venture to say that most Baha'is that you meet, I would say that they that's a sweet philosophy. But he did not mean that like literally. And what I'm learning through Dr. Joe's work is that Abdul Baha not only was it a nice thing to say, but he meant that literally. Yeah, and, yeah. From what I understand, the the high concept, you know, w one of the hindrances to spiritual development in the Baha'i concept is this concept of an insistent, self-serving self, which is true in Buddhism. It's probably true in all faiths. All faiths. You know, yeah. me, 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 I, I, yeah. I. You know, yeah. so uh, he totally nails it on the head. Yeah. Um, you know, the Dalai Lama has a, a quote. Um, you know. Every human being loves themselves, uh, but by helping someone else, you're able to build your own happy future. So he says, better to be wise, selfish, than foolish, selfish. You know, if you want to be selfish, okay, help someone else, and then you'll yeah. you know you'll feel it back. And yeah. and that's kind of what what these guys are saying, whether it's Joe Dispenza or uh, the great saints from the Baha'i past. Yeah, absolutely. And really, Morty, if you look at all the world's religions. It's all the same. Oh yeah, for sure. Every, like if I put, if we put a, a page of quotes together that represented all the world's religions and asked each of their, and you know, their followers to say who said what, <laughs> most people would not be able right, to get right. that right. That's a great, because that's a it's one. one, Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, there's, yeah. there's no clear. So I did a deep dive into Dr. Joe's work because of, this harmony of science and religion for me. And so I just returned from Mexico where I attended a corporate training seminar where I am becoming, I will be certified as a neuroscience of change consultant. Beautiful. And it really is, I will be teaching his work. And that is not me putting together his work with the Baha'i faith, but in my own personal life, I have learned that we have to see so much more clearly how science impacts religion and how religion and or faith impacts science. And to see this, you know, coming together, I gave a talk last year, right at the beginning of COVID to a group of people in the North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham area. And there was a 16, 17 year old brother and sister who sing and play the guitar. And I'd ask them, you know, would you open this talk for me and sing a prayer? And I was really honored that they said that they would because they're an incredible duo. And I was kind of surprised because I thought they were only going to sing their prayer and then leave, but they stayed for the Sunday worship service for my talk. And at the end of it, the, the, the brother, the young man said, you know, Faith, I just want to thank you so much for this talk. It was the most life transforming talk I've ever heard. And I, I, I was so moved by what he said, because I knew that, like, had I learned this when I was 16, like my life would be completely different. And, you know, one of the things that Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about and this is definitely talked about in the Baha'i writings, although not as it's, it's a guidance and it's throughout all the prayers and all the writings, but it's not as succinct as the way that Dr. Joe Dispenza says it. But he, you know, he says, do you actually believe that you are a creator of your reality? Because we are, each of us are creators of our realities and his philosophy, his belief is that you create by going into meditation. So he said, so if you really do believe that you are the creator of your own reality, would you ever miss a day? <laughs> you know, people say there are two reasons they don't meditate. What are the two reasons why? 
you being a meditator, you may not know this, but I think all of us know why the two reasons. Uh, I've heard a lot more than two reasons, but. Okay, uh, but what are the top two that everyone you know, I, says? Uh, too many thoughts going on. I get antsy. Um, I've got other things to do. I don't have the time. Yeah. So those are the, those are the two. I don't have the time and I don't know how. Right. So again, if you believed that you were creating your reality, would you not have the time? And meditation And this is something that I've really, truly learned over the last two and a half years. It's a practice. And the more you practice something, the better you get at it. So you're referring to motivation uh, on one hand. How do you motivate people to try it? Hey, if this is going to, you know, be your reality, you're going to create your own reality. And I would think you'd want to do this. And motivation is great. And people typically come to meditation because there's something that's wrong and they sense something that's wrong in their lives. They're not happy, whatever. Stress, the doctor says, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. No one comes to meditation because my life is perfect. Can I learn how to? Doesn't happen that way. And from what I've seen and uh, what happens is people are not taught properly and their expectations of what they're going to get at it are just inappropriate. So, um, because like I said, if I have 30, 40, 50, 60 years of thinking a certain way, it ain't going to change because you taught, gave, I sat in on a meditation class. Dime. <laughs> so what I tell people when they come to a class that I teach, and right now I've taught over 900,000 people how to meditate, secular meditation, not Buddhist. Wow. Uh, approaching a million, um, is if you sit down and meditate, I'm going to give you a grade. Okay, the course is almost over. I'm going to give you a grade now. Here's the, here's the deal. If you sit down and meditate, you get an A. You meditate twice in a day, you get an A+. Plus. If you don't meditate at all, you don't get a grade. Now, what am I not leaving out? Here's what I'm not saying. You know, okay, you're going to sit down for 15 minutes. If you meditate for and you have no thoughts for seven minutes, I'm going to give you a B+. Plus. If you have 17, I don't, none of that matters. Because the fact of the matter is, if you sit down and meditate, even if you have thousands of thoughts coming through your mind, but you're, med- you're, you're sitting there following your breath, thoughts, 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 following your breath, 98% of the time you're busy with thoughts, 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 but you do follow your breath on a rare occasion here or there, you're going to get the benefit. So you get an A. And there's no fail. Oh, I failed. I can't. Me- that doesn't People have to understand the expectation. It's kind of like water in the big mountain. Big mountain, not going anywhere. Oh, yeah? Well, come back, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and you'll see the water. So we have to have a long-term view of it. It's not going to change overnight. And we have to emphasize the positive, which is, you're, you know, I went to the gym. Uh, you know, I'm going to go to the gym. What are we in now? May? Oh, June? I'm going to go to the gym, gym next month, July, on the 18th, I think. I'm going to go one time. I'm going to be <laughs> so much stronger. Not going to work. No. And the other side is, I went to the gym, I could only do 40 pounds today, I'm used to doing 45 pounds. Well, you know what, guess what? You still get the benefits. Mm -hmm. So people need to be taught that. Of course, there's lots of other reasons for success or failure, there's that word again, uh, for why people continue to meditate or don't, Mm -hmm. don't use that word. Mm -hmm. Um, But that to me is, is, you're, you're hitting upon motivation, I agree 100%. And then the second part is expectation. And then, of course, you got to be user-friendly and teaching people how to motivate. That's for sure, too. Well, and for me, it was a process. So for me, I tried, like, I found one of Dr. Joe Dispenza's. I really enjoyed listening to his podcasts and his talks because he he provides such a wonderful explanation of the things that I was being challenged by in my life and so many of the people that I know around me, their challenges. And so he talked a lot about meditation. So I tried one of his, I found a meditation online on YouTube that I think was an 18 minute meditation. And it was in the beginning, it was kind of a little weird for me. Like he's talking about the space between space and, you know, it was something that I really couldn't grasp my, I couldn't grasp at the time that I was introduced to it, but I knew that I needed to meditate. So 
Oprah and Deepak were doing a one of those 21 day free meditation things. And I was like, I can commit to that. It's 15 minutes. And, you know, Oprah gives a little introduction and, you know, that's four or five minutes. And then Deepak gives a little introduction. And so I'm only meditating really for like probably six or seven minutes. I can handle that. Like I can sit still for 15 minutes and hear some beautiful words from both of them and then like do a mantra. So that was like the next level for me. And then I was like, okay, so I have a really hard time sitting quietly with my like and all the chatter in my brain so the whole following your breath thing I've never really understood that personally so I didn't really go down that realm very deep but I found this 15 minute meditation because I'm like I can sit for 15 minutes and just clear my mind so I found this thing on Instagram, Eddie Sturgis, 15 minute manifestation meditation. And I listened to this like long history of his story and everything. And then it was like, it's a money back guarantee for one year. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be way more expensive than I can afford if they're offering a money back guarantee for a whole year. (laughs) And it gets finally to the end. And I stuck with it. It was like $49.99 and you get four meditations. And I was like, I can do that. Like, okay. And it was interesting because he was talking about biennial. How do I say that word? Uh, Biennial. A biannual, yes. Okay. Biannual. Yes. Biannual beats. And how our left brain and our right brain is often like in chatter and competition with each other. And this first week, week one of the, the first meditation was to harmonize the left and the right brain. And then the second week was to... Actually, now I don't remember what the second week was. It's been a couple of years since I did this, but the third week was moving into abundance. And what I would do, so one of the laws of the Baha'i faith is to say the word pa, which means God is most glorious 95 times a day. And it was very interesting because I remember like asking my mother, there's, there's a passage where Baha'u'llah talks about how backbiting is the most grievous of all sins. And I remember I was eight or nine years old and I asked my mom why, you know, I don't understand why, you know, backbiting is worse than stabbing or killing or beating or raping or, you know, like killing someone. How is backbiting worse than that? And Baha'u'llah says that backbiting quenches the life of the spirit and extinguishes the light of the soul. And I never really like, I'm like, okay, I read that and I'm like, interesting, but I really didn't, you know, I was a teenager. I didn't really comprehend it. And all of a sudden when I'm in like my thirties, I discovered Dr. Emoto's work. And for those of you who are you familiar with Dr. Emoto's work? Oh, okay. So Dr. Emoto was a Japanese scientist who studied water. And what he did was he t- took pictures of the ice crystals. Yes, and he, I've seen his, so, yes, yes. So he would go into, you know, his philosophy was that all of us are energy and energy has a signature. And we ourselves, our bodies are 78% water. So he had wanted to do some experiments about how thoughts, and words impact water. So he went in, he took one source of water, he divided it up into different vials. He'd go into a soundproof room and he'd say the word love with one of the waters. And he'd go into a room and say the word hate with another bottle. And then he'd freeze the water and there were like three seconds of time where they could take pictures of the ice crystals that were formed from both of these waters. The water that heard the word love made a beautiful and perfect snowflake every single time. Ice crystallization, gorgeous. The water that heard the word hate was yellowish and deformed and never completely like formed into a beautiful shape. 
And he thought, well, that's interesting. Everything has to do with vibration. So when I, the, the vibration of my voice, when I say the word love is elevated. So maybe that's impacting the water. So he said, well, what if I tape the words to the water? So the water is never hearing anything, but the intention is taped on to the jar that the water holds within it. Exact same thing happened. He was like, okay, what if I don't say it? What if I don't tape it, but I only think it? The exact same thing happened. And I'm like, oh my God, finally. Like, I understand why backbiting is the most grievous of all sins. Like here, 30 years later, I'm learning that, okay, so when I'm saying bad things about someone, it is impacting the cellular, the water, the cellular makeup in their bodies. So I'm like, whoa, that is so deep. Like, again, that whole harmony of science and religion, I'm super excited and geeked out on it. So, so following, going back to my meditation and the 95 Allah pause. So if I'm saying God is most glorious 95 times a day, what is that doing to my own cellular makeup, the water in my body? And I learned that during that 15 minute manifestation meditation, that the first six or seven minutes, I would do my 95 Allah pause. And then I'd have six or seven, eight minutes to sit quietly and just clear my mind. And I could handle that. You know, that was something that I could do. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, very interesting and exciting to me is you're so motivated that you said, Hey, I'm going to try this meditation. I'm going to try that one. I'm going to try. And there's thousands, tens of thousands of of meditations out there. And you said, I'm going to find the one that works for me. Exactly. And it may not be observing your breath. It may be listening to music. It may be guided meditation. It may be uh, feel your arm relax, feel your leg, you know, all these yeah. kind of gu- yeah. guides, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I agree, not every meditation, not every student that I taught meditation, oh, thank you so much. That worked 100%, 100% of the time. No, there's going to be people and I encourage people my voice may not be right for you. Someone else's voice it could be the voice, could be lots of different right. things. Right. So, so I, I love to hear that you pursued it until you found the one that worked for you. Yeah. Um, and then as far as uh, th- this other gentleman's, uh, you know, scientific findings, you know, in Buddhism, they, some of the great masters have said, you know, one moment of anger is enough to erase, you know, thousands of years of good merit. And I kind of looked at that as metaphorical, except you, what you're saying, no, it's not metaphor. That's what happens because mm-hmm. there's a whole cellular thing going on. Not only is it cellular, but it's also genetic because yeah. when a mother has some kind of, or a woman, probably man too, has some kind of horrible thing happen to them, uh, the genetics change and mm-hmm. that can be transferred into the baby who then grows up to be anxious. Well, and and one of the incredible things about that, Morty, is that they are proving scientifically, again, by looking at DNA samples, that when we've had trauma in our life, whether it's historical trauma from past generations or some traumatic event or events that have happened in our own lives, that that shows up on our DNA and that once we have healed that trauma through whatever practices we need to heal that, but there is a way to heal it. If that has happened to you, there is a way to heal it. That when they go back and look at the DNA, the marker is gone. Yeah. It it kind of gets into neuroplasticity and that whole, um, for sure, you know, but on a cellular level, absolutely. So um, th- that's one of the bazillion reasons that I'm very big on proponent of meditation for as many people as possible. Um, anyways, on that very happy note, and I love those stories because uh, I'm going to remember them and our viewers will remember them and that will have a, a great imprint. Thank you for being here today. Yay! Thank you for having <laughs> me. It's really been an honor to have this time with you. I, I learned a lot. And uh, now, how could I learn a lot? I thought I knew, I. I knew everything, 
before, so how could I be learning more? I must be have overflow in the brain, I guess. There's always room for more wisdom. And I learned a lot from you today too. So thank, thank you so you. much for your sharing. No, th thank you. I will stay in touch. Excellent. And uh, I'll probably email you after the show because I want to follow up on some of the wonderful work that you talked about. Thank you, Morty. Have a great day. Beautiful. You too. All right. Be blessed. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our talk with Faith Holmes. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the It's Not What You Think podcast. That really helps us to continue to produce these episodes and invite other guests from around the world. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or would like to hear any specific guests on the podcast, please share my email, mortylevine at gmail.com, or visit mortylevine.com. Remember, it's not what you think.